And now that we've talked about how precipitation forms, we can begin our next lecture, which talks about types of precipitation. So, what types of precipitation have you experienced? Well, let's see what types there are first, and then I'll ask you to comment on this below at the end of the video. So, there are five types of precipitation. They're called rain, snow, sleet, freezing rain, and hail. Now, most people have been in rain before. Most people have been in snow before, and most people have been in hail before. But what about sleet and freezing rain? Well, I'm pretty proud to say that in the most recent years, I've actually experienced both of them, and they're both pretty fascinating. But let's talk about all five of these now. So first off, rain. Now, I'm sure we all know what rain is. Rain is water falling from the sky, right? But how do we actually formally define rain as meteorologists? What makes the difference between rain and drizzle, or rain and showers? Well, Rain is actually precipitation that's in the form of droplets that are larger than half a millimeter in diameter. If you recall the last lecture, the average raindrop size is about two millimeters in diameter. So this occurs, and so that, that's well qualified as a raindrop. However, the smallest raindrops are about half a millimeter in diameter. Anything smaller than that, we call drizzle. Now, sometimes as this rain or drizzle falls from a cloud, it actually begins to evaporate. This occurs when the air beneath the cloud is so dry, so unsaturated, that as the raindrop is falling, it evaporates before reaching the ground. And vert is actually not that uncommon. We actually see it regularly, even here in California. And then finally, if you've ever heard of showers before, um, if you ever watched the weather forecast and they said, okay, well today we're gonna have rain and tomorrow we're gonna have showers. What's the difference between the two? Well, rain is a steady, sustained precipitation, whereas showers occur when Water's been held up by an updraft, and then it all falls at once. So rain is steady, it keeps going, it's, it's, it's very well sustained, whereas a shower is kind of here today, gone five minutes from now. Showers are very much more scattered, and they don't really last long, whereas rain can last hours and be much more widespread. Now, looking at these three raindrops, which one do you think is the one that, rain, that the raindrop actually looks like? Now, I'm sure most people think that raindrops kind of look like tears, right? Well, believe it or not, it's not true. Small droplets actually have a very spherical shape. Large droplets actually have a very lenticular shape. They almost look like spaceships in a way. Here's an image of Virga. That's actually these wisps coming out of the clouds. It almost looks like the cloud is trying to reach down to the earth. In this case, what's actually happening is this is actually rain falling from the cloud, but it's evaporating before it hits the ground because the air down here is too dry. Now, what about snow? Well, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, most of the rain that we get actually starts off as snow. And this is because of the Bergeron process, that's the process of ice crystals growing, is a lot easier than the collision and coalescence process. It might not be easier for you to remember it, but it's much easier in a natural sense. As a result, snow is actually where most precipitation starts off as. Now, as the snow begins to fall to the ground, temperatures near the ground are usually much warmer than temperatures aloft. As a result, the snow melts in terrain. And if, on the other hand, the air near the ground is cold, the snow may actually remain snow. But even so, 
Snow can even fall in temperatures that are slightly above the freezing level. And this is just because the snow didn't have enough time to melt into rain. So in temperatures 33, 34, 35, temperatures slightly above the freezing level, so one, two, three degrees Celsius, is still enough to actually allow snow to fall. There are many different snowflakes and, and it's just so incredible how many individual symmetric looking snowflakes there are. Something that always just boggles my mind as a meteorologist is how such random processes can create such beautiful looking snowflakes. And these are just a few examples. Now, can it ever be too cold for snow? Now, if you recall from the last lecture, you have liquid water crystals that are called, or sorry, liquid water droplets called supercooled droplets, as well as these large, um, as well as these large ice crystals. Well, the colder the air gets, the less of these supercooled droplets you have. That's because the colder the air, the less water vapor there is. It makes it harder for water to evaporate. It makes it much harder for these droplets to sustain themselves. Therefore, the colder the air is, the less snow there is. So it can actually be too cold for snow. And in fact, snowflakes also get much smaller with colder temperatures. If you've ever been in California, gone up to one of our local mountains and seen snow, the snow is probably very big, wet, heavy flakes. If you ever go somewhere where the temperature is well below zero, you probably see snow that's more powdery. And it's because it's so cold that those snowflakes can't grow too big. So yes, it actually can get too cold for snow. In fact, the coldest snow ever was observed at minus 53 degrees Fahrenheit. Any colder than that, there's been no snow observed. So yeah, the temperature can get cold enough to where it can't snow. Now, if you've ever looked at a rain cloud before and it's looked really dark below it, chances are that area that's really dark right below it is actually snow. And then as the snow melts into rain, it lightens up a little bit. This is because snow scatters sunlight much easier than rain does. As a result, any sunlight that hits the snow gets scattered back out, and therefore what you see is much darker. On the other hand, for rain, a lot of the sunlight can still pass through it to your eyes. Now, where is snow most common? Well, here's a map of the United States, and let me just say a few things about this. Down here, this is the south of the United States. This is closer to the equator. Up here, this is the north of the United States. This is closer to the poles. One of the things that you immediately notice is the higher up you go in latitude, which means the further away from the equator you go, the snowier it gets. However, you also notice some pretty interesting snow patterns. Here's why these happen. This little area of snow here is due to the Sierra Nevada. Up here, this area of snow is due to the Cascades. This big area of snow here is the Rocky Mountains. So these are all higher elevation areas. Higher elevations allow for cold temperatures as well as more orographic lifting, therefore you get more precipitation. This little, what looks like a comma, this area here is called the Appalachian Mountains. This is also a pretty good area for snow. But then there's also another more interesting area. And the interesting area is actually over here. Or right here. Or all over here. Here's what's actually happening in these regions. These regions are downwind of the Great Lakes. So you have Lake Superior up here, you have Lake Michigan down here, 
you have Huron and Erie over here. And what actually happens is during the winter time, even though the air over here becomes very cold, these lakes retain their heat a lot longer than, than the air does. They don't cool down as fast. That's because they have higher specific heats. As a result, they can stay relatively warm. Well, what actually happens is, as cold air blows over these warm lakes, that actually causes the warm air, or the, or the warm air over these lakes, to cool and condense, forming clouds. These clouds are then blown on shore by the winds, creating this snow. This is what's called lake effect snow. And in fact, these areas here where the lake effect snow is represent some of the snowiest areas in the United States. If you actually live over here in Buffalo, this area over here, this is one of the snowiest areas in the United States with snow well over 100 inches per year. That's a lot of snow. Think about that. Think about if you went outside and, and you were covered in 100 inches of snow. It's insane to think about it. It's, it's mind-boggling how snowy it gets there due to lake effect snow. Now, other types of precipitation, and these are the types that if I were to ask you what types of precipitation you've been in, these are the ones that you probably haven't been in. Or maybe if you have, you didn't realize it or so on. Sleet is one of these types. In order for sleet to exist, there must be a strong inversion present. If you don't remember, an inversion occurs when temperatures rise as you go up in the atmosphere. So what you end up getting is you end up getting a setup where you have very cold air near the surface of the earth and warmer air aloft. In this case, snowflakes falling from clouds enter that warm layer of air where they melt into raindrops. Then as they fall close to the surface, they get into that cold layer near the surface where they immediately freeze back into ice pellets. Now this isn't the same as hail. Hail forms in a completely different process that we'll talk about in a few minutes. So the way that this works is again you have snowflakes falling out of a cloud. They enter this shallow warm layer above the surface of the earth where they melt and then as they fall further down they then freeze again into sleet. Here's an image of a sleet covered area. Kind of looks like snow. The pellets are really tiny. I actually got to experience sleet for my very first time just two years ago and it was incredible. Now how does this differ from freezing rain? Freezing rain actually forms in a very, very, very similar pattern. The only thing that's different is that the inversion near the surface is very shallow. What this means is that only the air right above the surface, so maybe a few meters above the surface, is actually freezing. Everything above that is warm enough for just regular rain. What happens in this case is that liquid the, those raindrops, that liquid water that's falling through into that cold layer doesn't have enough time to freeze before it hits the ground. So instead, it freezes as it hits the ground. And it creates lots of layers of ice. And it looks incredible. But it can also create lots of mayhem. Storms with lots of freezing rain are called ice storms. Here's how freezing rain looks on the branches of a tree. Now, if you woke up and you looked outside, this might look beautiful. It almost looks like a winter wonderland. The problem is, is that this ice is extremely heavy. And so when ice is forming on the sides of these trees, that's causing the trees to be weighed down substantially. As they're being weighed down substantially, they become 
heavier and heavier, and eventually they break. This doesn't just happen with trees. This also happens with power lines. Here's an image from an ice storm in 1998 that extended from New England to Canada. This storm was so intense and it caused so much damage due to broken power lines due to heavy ice that it actually left many people without power, millions of people. And it created over $5 billion in damage. So even though these ice storms can look beautiful, they can also cause a lot of havoc. This is an image of downtown, if I recall, Montreal in an ice storm. Now, what about aircraft and icing? Well, just like ice can form on power lines or trees or anything else, it can also form on aircraft wings. And this is really, really dangerous because in order for an aircraft to properly fly, it needs to have its wings, they're what are called airfoils, these wings need to be the proper shape. When you put ice on them, you're changing the aerodynamics of these wings. That could make them not airworthy, unable to fly, which could cause your plane to stall, fall, and crash. This actually happened um, a couple of decades ago in Washington, D.C. There was a flight, uh, Air Florida Flight 90, that was taking off from Florida, from um, Washington, D.C. and flying to Florida. And what actually happened was they didn't de-ice their plane in time to take off, but they still took off. They couldn't get enough speed. Their plane stalled and crashed into the Potomac River. If you want to learn more about this, I recommend Googling it or reach out to me if you want to see a documentary on it. I actually have a documentary on it called When Weather Changed History. Now, this icing can also damage aircraft engines, such as Scandinavian Airlines Flight 751. Now, if you're flying tonight and you're worried about ice forming on your aircraft, don't, though. Pictures like this one right here are much rarer now. The reason why is because flights like Air Florida uh, Flight 90 actually really caused the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, to become a lot stricter when it came to things such as icing. And so now, when a plane gets de-iced, if it hasn't taken off after a certain amount of time, it has to get back in line and get de-iced again. Also, aircraft are also equipped with onboard de-icing measures that can allow ice to melt or be mixed out of the air. And so there are many different ways that we can prevent aircraft icing from becoming an issue in the future. Here's an example of an aircraft undergoing de-icing. And it just looks like it's being sprayed with water. But basically what's happening is before this plane can take off, it has to have all the ice removed from it. Now the last thing I'll talk about is hail. The way hail works is very different from sleet. Sleet works when you have liquid droplets falling from a cloud and freezing as they hit the ground. Hail, however, forms in intense thunderstorms. And the way it forms is it forms when there's extremely strong updrafts that are forced that force raindrops up to the top of a cloud where they quickly freeze, fall back down as hail. The more times that they get carried up by the updraft, the larger they become. You can actually take a hailstone, cut it open, and see what look like a series of rings. And those rings can tell you how many times this hailstone has actually circled that cloud, gone up to the top, gathered a new layer, and fallen back down.
And this process can continue to happen. So it looks like this. You have raindrops that would otherwise be falling getting sucked up into the updraft where they grow, they freeze, fall back down, get carried back up, freeze again, fall, grow, get carried back up, and they keep doing this. And every time they go up to the top, they gain a new layer. Eventually, they fall out of the cloud and down to the surface of the Earth. Hail can get pretty big. These are images of hail that are dime size, penny size, nickel size, quarter size, and golf ball sized hail. Imagine getting hit by a hailstone the size of a golf ball. I've seen them before. But actually, hail gets even bigger. In this case, you see hailstones that are golf ball sized, grapefruit sized, and softball sized hail. Some that are even bigger than people's palms. So hail can get extremely, extremely large. Now where is hail most common here in the United States? Well, in a few weeks we'll be talking about thunderstorms and where they're most common. But hail is actually most common over here in eastern Colorado, southwest Miami, or Miami, Wyoming, oh my gosh. Southwest Wyoming, and a little bit over Nebraska, but it's this region here where hail is most common. Now what's interesting is just to the east, this region over here is where tornadoes are most common. We'll talk more about that in a few weeks. But again, that's how hail forms. Now, there are many ways you can measure precipitation, and I do have a few slides on that. But we can talk about that another time. Um, this is all that you need to know for this module. Here's inside of a hailstone. If you have any other questions, please feel free to contact